We've talked a lot over the years about the many different promotions and territories that would form the foundation of the company that would give us Crow Sting, Goldberg, and the NWO. But before any of that could happen, this company itself needed to have its own origin story. And that's what we're finally here to discuss, because this is the history of World Championship Wrestling. Please support this channel by subscribing, and you could support it even further by signing up over on my Patreon page, just like Mr. J and Freehand and the rest of my amazing, awesome Patreon supporters. Thank all of you so much. Now, just to be perfectly clear, this episode is primarily going to focus on the very early years of World Championship Wrestling. And I mean the one from Atlanta and not the one from Australia. But how early are we talking here? Well, since I've already covered the history of Jim Crockett promotions and the history of Georgia Championship Wrestling, as well as covered the events of Black Saturday and a lot of the other parts that went into making WCW in previous videos, I figure let's pick up where those left off. Oh, by the way, stick around to the end if you want links to those videos. Anyway, for now, our story begins when Ted Turner purchased Jim Crockett Promotions on October 11th, 1988, where it was originally incorporated as the Universal Wrestling Corporation by TBS. Of course, that name would not stick. The sale became completed on November 2nd, 1988, the same day as a television taping of the show NWA World Championship Wrestling, which took place in the company's official home office of Atlanta, Georgia. Now, World Championship Wrestling was the name of the old NWA show, and with it being familiar to their audiences, WCW would become the name of the promotion under Turner. Having experienced a backlash of Black Saturday, Ted Turner knew the importance of maintaining the familiar to their establishment established audience during the changeover. It should also be noted that initially it was still a part of the National Wrestling Alliance. Again, already covered, but to quickly recap, one way or another, Crockett had acquired control over several major promotions and JCP more or less operated as the NWA itself, trying to compete nationally and going against their competition of the WWF. And now that Ted Turner had purchased Jim Crockett promotions, WCW would also effectively be doing the same thing going forward. Although that's not to say that every Thing remained the same. One of the most major occurrences happened right away in the new regime. Going into the purchase, Dusty Rhodes was the head booker. Now, he had a run of success early on, but he had begun to burn out, as bookers tend to do after a while. Especially when considering that Dusty was booking against Vince McMahon in the 80s. That's Vince Prime. There's no way that could have been easy to do. Although he did have one major victory, as he booked the show Clash of Champions to air against WrestleMania, but he did it on cable instead of pay-per-view. And with this strategy and in the midst of direct competition, Sting vs. Flair for 15 minutes managed to outdraw that of Mania. And this moment would let everyone know that Sting was a star. But despite this, Dusty's booking career was winding down. He would continually overuse what would be known as the Dusty finish, and he would begin to clash backstage with Ric Flair. And most of all, the straw that would break the camel's back would be when he scripted himself to do a forbidden spot at Starcade on December 26, 1988. Dusty booked an angle where he would get cut open from a Road Warrior spike. This was in direct violation of Turner's new no blood policy, and with Dusty's dismissal, it showed that the new owner meant a business. The American Dream was replaced by Ric Flair, even though the Nature Boy was also the current world champion at the time. Flair had brought in seasoned talents such as Ricky Steamboat and Terry Funk, however, he was also continuing to develop the fresh talents from the old guard too such as the previously mentioned Sting, who Flair had promised to drop the title to only for Sting to wind up getting injured. This led to the company instead wanting Ric Flair to put over Lex Luger as the new champion, but Flair refused, wanting to stay true to his word. This, of course, was viewed by some as a conflict of interest, as there were those who felt that Flair was monopolizing the world title and abusing his power as head booker. As a result, Flair was fired from his booking position in 1990, although unlike Dusty, who was fired completely and left for WWF, Flair would still remain on as a wrestler, at least for the time being. And he would also get to win the world title after this, even without the power of the book. His position would be given to fellow 
Horseman member, Ole Anderson. Although, this meant a somewhat surprising shift, as Ole began making the program more like the competition, the WWF, aiming more at younger audiences by featuring over-top style gimmicks and promotion, with such stunts such as bringing in Robocop to WCW. And yes, somehow an R-rated movie character was considered marketing towards children. Uh, what can I say, it was a different time back then. This change in tone was all the more shocking when we remember that Ole was the booker for Georgia Championship Wrestling, who famously was the one who got the shaft when Black Saturday occurred. However, this is not to say that Ole didn't retain some of the old ways. Some might even say he did just a little too much, as Anderson primarily focused on older talents that had remained loyal to him throughout the years. This, combined with other factors, would result in WCW's house shows dropping to record lows. Despite this, World Championship Wrestling would still seek to break out on its own, distancing itself from the NWA. After all, what's the benefit of being in an alliance if you pretty much are the alliance? I mean, you're aligned with yourself anyway, so what difference does it make? And so, even though Ric Flair was recognized as the NWA World Title Holder, WCW began referring to him as the WCW World Champion, and other measures like that would continue. What was once NWA Starcade in 1989 would become WCW Starcade in 1990, as they started pushing more and more of the NWA branding out, only to then officially split from the Alliance in 1991. Although some ties would still remain. Ric Flair would win the championship from Sting at this time being awarded the NWA's big gold belt, but being referred to as the WCW World Champion. The promotion would somehow simultaneously continue to claim the NWA's lineage while still maintaining that this was now the WCW Championship. Weirder still, the NWA also still recognized Flair as their champion. And all this happened while WCW was still using the NWA's physical title belt. Well, that is, until a man named Jim Hurd. Jim Hurd was an outsider to the wrestling industry, serving as both a manager of KPLR-TV in St. Louis and also as a manager for Pizza Hut. And with that resume, he somehow became president of WCW, and he would have a direct clash with champion Ric Flair, where he allegedly wanted the Nature Boy to shave his head and start using a brand new gimmick, that of a gladiator named Spartacus, in order to more closely resemble the type of presentation one would find in the WWE. WF. And then, after failed contract negotiations, Flair would be fired and stripped of his world title, at least in spirit, as the physical belt was still in Flair's possession. For you see, back then, it was customary for their champion to pay a large cash deposit for the belt, which you would get back upon returning it once your reign was over. According to Flair, they refused to give him his money back. And so, Flair figured that the belt was his for the keeping, after essentially paying 25 grand for it. And therefore, he saw no problem in taking the belt all the way to the WWF, where it appeared on camera during Flair's debut for Vince McMahon. After this, WCW went back to the NWA to renegotiate a partnership deal, and with their powers combined, they sued the WWF to get them to stop showing the belt on TV. Before we continue, if you're enjoying yourself, please hit that like button and make sure you're subscribed to this channel, and also see that your notifications are working, that way you know whenever brand new content comes out. Anyway, with that being said, let's get back into the video. But alas, Flair wasn't the only one who had problems with Jim Hurd. Stan Hansen, Jim Cornette, Stan Lane, and the Road Warriors all left the promotion due to Hurd. To make matters worse, starting in 1991, the company began to drop significantly, and so Hurd was fired in January of 1992, and was briefly replaced by a man named Kip Allen Frey, only for Cowboy Bill Watts to take over later that year. Now, Watts would become a highly controversial figure in WCW as it placed a strict code of conduct upon talent and had several issues concerning prejudice, particularly accusations of anti-Semitism from Paul Heyman and Raven. This resulted in Watts resigning. And so, he would be replaced by a protege of Vern Gagne, who hailed from the American Wrestling Association. And that man was none other than Eric Bischoff. And by taking this job, he was taking on quite a lot. Not only was he another in a surprisingly long line of top WCW executives for the company's short history, but also all of his predecessors were unable to get World Championship Wrestling to the heights that they had hoped for, being a promotion that was capable of rivaling the WWF and perhaps maybe even surpassing them. Up until this point, WCW had tried all kinds of people with all kinds of experience levels to lead the charge, some with a history in the wrestling 
wrestling business, and others, not so much. Where does Eric Bischoff fit in? Well, he started off in the sales department for the AWA syndicated programming division, when all of a sudden, their announcer at the time, Larry Nelson, got arrested for suspicion of DUI. And so, Greg Gagne, Vern's son, had to find someone to cover. Fast. And that's when he noticed Eric Bischoff was already wearing a suit and could be brought into the studio immediately, although Bischoff himself had no desire to be on air. The following year, and the writing was on the wall for the AWA, and Bischoff, now having a taste for being on TV, auditioned for the WWF, but to no avail. Then, in 1991, Dusty Rhodes would make his return to WCW, and he would be placed on the promotion's booking committee. And during that year's Great American Bash, we would see the debut of a new low-level announcer for the company, Eric Bischoff, who would be working immediately under producer Tony Schiavone and WCW's Vice President of Broadcasting, Jim Ross, both of whom were considered to be top favorites to take over for Bill Watts after Watts resigned in 1993. However, it would be Eric Bischoff who would go directly to WCW President and TBS Executive Bill Shaw, as well as approaching WCW Executive Vice President Bob Dew to apply for the job. And he would impress the both of them so much with his business savvy and non-confrontational tactics that the two went ahead and gave Eric Bischoff Bill Watts' old position. Naturally, this was going to cause a lot of issues, particularly with Jim Ross, who was irate that this new talent who was just as subordinate was now his superior. JR demanded his release, and it was given to him, as he would leave to work for the WWF. However, this sword cut both ways, because while Ross was leaving WCW for WWF, someone was doing things the other way around. Ric Flair, as the Nature Boy came back to WCW in February of 1993 after taking an opt-out clause in his WWF contract. Flair had been out of WWF's main event scene for some time, and his major reason for leaving WCW, Jim Hurd, wasn't there anymore. And so, the Nature Boy took this as an opportunity to go back to World Championship Wrestling. But this created something of a conundrum. As mentioned previously, Ric Flair would bring the big gold belt with him over to the house of McMahon, and from there, things would get a little confusing with the title's history. And I didn't really get into it all that much last time, so uh, let's do that now and go back to 1991. After the initial buyout of JCP, WCW existed while still carrying the NWA name, but it would slowly be phased out. Then, on January 11th, 1991, Ric Flair would defeat Sting to win the NWA world title. But in doing so, he would also officially be recognized as the first WCW world champion too. But then, after Nates left for WWF, WCW looked at this as a chance to really solidify their own brand. And so, after stripping Flair of the title in name, but before they had the physical belt returned to him, they would commission a new championship title belt, and this one would be a true WCW world title, and it would be awarded to the winner of a steel cage match between Lex Luger and Barry Windham. Windham would serve as the replacement for Flair, who was originally advertised for the match. And so, at the Great American Bash, WCW planned to finally unveil their very own world title belt, and award it to Lex Luger for winning the match. Only the belt they ordered? hadn't come in yet. And so, they would have to use one of Dusty's old Championship Wrestling from Florida belts with a World Championship Wrestling plate added onto the front. Look how convincing that is. Anyway, the real belt would arrive soon thereafter, as would the old big gold belt after Flair returned it. Although, for some reason, Flair would still be listed by the Alliance as the NWA Champion until September, despite WCW no longer recognizing him in July. Like I said, the whole thing is really weird. Okay, let's go back to the present. Or, I mean, let's go back to where we left off in the past. In 1993, Flair was home in WCW, and the big gold belt was there too. But there was already a WCW World Title Belt and a WCW World Champion. What to do about this? Well, they took the old strap and they turned it into the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship, a separate title from WCW's World Belt. Now, did this count as a World Championship? Well, that is up for debate, but if you ask the PW Insider, the answer is no. It all depends on who you ask. But this title wouldn't last for very long, as Flair would unify the international title with WCW's world title. And he did this again by beating Sting, this time at Clash of the Champions 27 the following year. And by doing this, the big gold belt would once again serve as the official WCW World Championship title belt. Now, going back to Eric Bischoff, because he would be, yet again, getting into it with someone who had worked over him. This time, it would be Bob Dew himself. First, the two would work as partners, but then they would continue 
continuously get into disputes over what direction they should take the company. Eventually, Bischoff would be promoted to senior vice president, putting him in charge of pretty much everything involving WCW. This would cause Dew to resign, along with WCW junior vice president Jim Barnett and WCW's event manager. And this is where Eric Bischoff's master plan began to take shape, as he convinced the higher-ups over at Turner that if they were ever going to have a viable product, then they would have to invest in their product. And so, his strategy broke down to three main parts. The WWF has been long regarded and still is even today for having the most polished television product in all of professional wrestling. And so, if WCW was going to take them down, they had to at least look the part, meaning making a wrestling show that looked just as good as Vince's. And so, Bischoff had the filming relocated to Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. But this came at a high cost. So, in order to save money, WCW would pre-tape as much as they possibly could well in advance. But this caused a lot of problems, especially considering that most of the Disney Studios audience were tourists, allowing spoilers to circulate a lot faster around the country. This upset the NWA, who still had a working relationship with WCW at the time. But in an attempt to remedy this, they actually created the greatest problem when it came to this formula, and it happened in the tag division. After filming Paul Roma and Arn Anderson as the new WCW World Tag Team Champions who had defeated the Hollywood Blondes, WCW decided that they were going to swerve the audience that had already seen this film take place by having Steve Austin and Brian Pillman retain the championships at Beach Blast, where the two were originally supposed to drop the belts, and then just have Roma and Anderson go over at the live Clash of the Champions instead. The only problem was, right before Clash of the Champions, Brian Pillman got injured, resulting in Steven Regal having to take his place. Now, this did work as a quick fix, but nevertheless, it shows the kinds of problems that WCW had filming far in advance in Florida. But speaking of Florida, that brings us to the next phase of the plan. Because also in Orlando, filming the show Thunder in Paradise was the newly available wrestler Hulk Hogan, who was fresh from the WWF after the steroid trials. Together, Eric Bischoff and Ric Flair convinced Hogan to sign with WCW. And while they had already signed former WWF talents like Jake Roberts, the British Bulldog, and Rick Rude, Hogan was obviously the big one. And while Vince McMahon thought that fans were over Hulk Hogan, the reality was that Hogamania was a lie and well and was working to grow WCW's audience. But that was only the beginning, with WCW expanding its roster even further, gaining either new talents or reacquiring old ones. And so, in order to bring these wrestlers in, Bischoff knew that he had to offer them things that they couldn't get anywhere else, like in the cases of Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, among others, creative control, as well as in Hulk Hogan's case, a percentage of the pay-per-view buys. But overall, when all else fails, just offered them lots of money. Lots and lots of money. Because a major part of this talent acquisition was guaranteed contracts, where you would get a downside guarantee, a minimum amount of money that would be promised to you no matter what, even if you were fired. And that money would be a sizable amount too. This was something that Vince McMahon had always been opposed to, with Scott Hall reportedly only being promised $150 a day for 10 days in WWF. In the years since, WWE would end up following suit, and now offers downside guarantees to their talents, all as a result of what Eric Bischoff did in WCW all those years ago. Additionally, there would be other talents acquired, as Bischoff raided other locker rooms and poached talents from elsewhere, enticing wrestlers with the promise of more money. Interestingly enough, McMahon would employ the same strategy when he first took over WWF. Okay, so now that we went over talent acquisition and production value, what about the third part of the plan? Well, that would be a show called WCW Monday Nitro. It all started when Ted Turner decided that he was out for blood against Vince McMahon. He went to Eric Bischoff and asked how could they compete with the WWF. And while Bischoff didn't think that Turner would ever go for it, he said that the only way they could ever do it is to have a weeknight show, one that could possibly be on Monday nights directly against Raw. And to his surprise, Turner said do it. Following this meeting, Uncle Eric came up with ideas for the show by watching episodes of Raw with a notepad. He wrote down what he liked and what he didn't like, and he would make his show in proving where he thought Raw was coming up short. For example, 
At the time, despite being first advertised as a live show, Raw was only live sometimes back then, with many episodes being taped in advance. And so, learning from his own mistakes and wanting to provide something that Raw was not, Bischoff decided that Monday Nitro would be live all the time. Now, for those of you who remember, originally Raw didn't put big marquee matches on Monday Night Raw, as the thinking was you just didn't give that away on regular TV. But not for WCW, as they figured the best way to lure people away from Monday Night Raw was to give them a higher caliber of matches. And that's exactly what they did. And so, in September of 1995, WCW Monday Nitro made its debut from the Mall of America in Minneapolis, Minnesota, delivering an action-packed first episode. By the way, the first match ever in WCW Nitro's history was Brian Pillman vs. Jushin Thunder Liger. Oh, and that reminds me, WCW also made a push to feature more international talents as well as working with other companies too, just something else that you were probably not going to find on Monday Night Raw. In fact, on this first episode of Nitro, there was a great promo package advertising the wrestler Sabu, who's going to have a great career in WCW. Okay, so not everything panned out as it was supposed to, but anyway. This was followed by a match for the United States title, where Sting, the defending champion, went against Ric Flair, and during that bout, we would see the return of Lex Luger, who would also be there after the main event, which was Big Bubba Rogers versus Hulk Hogan for the WCW World Championship. After Hogan retained, the Dungeon of Doom would jump him, and Luger would come in to make the save, and also to set up a title match for the following week's show, getting viewers excited to come back next Monday. Leading up to the Monday Night Wars, WCW already had a habit of picking up talent fresh off of their runs in the WWF. Talents such as the Big Boss Man, the British Bulldog, Jake the Snake Roberts, and many others would all go this route. But as great as some of these stars were, WCW was about to change the game with the biggest acquisition there ever was, Hulk Hogan. After the steroid trials, the WWF was seemingly going through a bit of housekeeping, and after Ric Flair opted to return to WCW, the WWF would also see Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan join their competition. This immediately started to turn the tide for WCW. McMahon began attempting to recover. He figured that he made megastars before and so he could do it again. Vince's strategy was twofold. One, make new stars, and two, attempt to devalue the old. Hogan would drop the belt to Yoko Zuna at the King of the Ring and exit the company after briefly working the international house show circuit, sitting out the rest of his contract. This was coming off the back of WrestleMania 9, where Hogan won the title and it wasn't well received by everyone and Vince figured this must mean that fans had outgrown Hulkamania. This, of course, was not true, as some really weren't quite ready to move on from the Hulkster. Hogan and others became a major boost for WCW, with many fans still longing for the old WWF stars that they loved, but just tuning into a different company in order to see them. Meanwhile, Vince tried to counter by mocking Hogan and Savage with his Huckster and Nacho Man campaign, and he would instead shift his focus to new stars, who wouldn't quite rise to the same level as their predecessors, but they would be the ones to carry the company nevertheless. These stars included Bret Hart, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Lex Luger. Luger, who had kept in contact with Sting, who was still in WCW, had expressed that he wanted to come back in the summer of 1995. Sting pleaded with Bischoff to bring Luger home, and he talked about how this would be a great get for the new era of the company. But Bischoff wasn't the biggest Luger fan, and so he offered the total package a fraction of what he had previously made in WCW, figuring that Lex would just turn it down. That way, he could tell Sting at least he tried. But surprisingly enough, Luger accepted. And just like that, he would jump ship, doing so a mere eight days after he made a quick appearance at WWF SummerSlam and the night after he worked a WWF house show, officially appearing on the debut episode of WCW Nitro. As previously mentioned, Bischoff designed Nitro to be Raw's superior in every way. For example, Raw was often taped back then, so Bischoff decided to always go live, and they would take advantage of that. From the very beginning, Bischoff would spoil the results of Monday Night Raw on WCW TV. The first night that both shows went head to head, Bischoff gave away the ending of Raw's main event, which had Shawn Michaels defeating Sid. While a lot of people out there remember WCW doing this for Mick Foley's world title win, which we we'll talk about later, there are those out there who might have forgotten that Nitro was doing this pretty much from the beginning. But even aside from that, Nitro was just offering a lot of things that Raw wasn't. They had a faster paced, more action packed show, they had the Nitro Girls, and they were also offering some pretty stacked cards, the kind that you normally have to wait till a pay per view to get. 
but they were giving it to you on weekly television. It didn't take long for WCW to score a win. It took exactly 21 days, and September 25th, 1995 would be the first time that WCW Nitro would beat Monday Night Raw, earning a rating of 2.7 against Raw's 1.9. Under Vince McMahon, the WWF was the dominant force in professional wrestling, but now the unthinkable was happening. Someone managed to beat the WWF and beat their flagship show. And for Raw, things would only get worse. Eric Bischoff would start off by offering big money contracts, like the one offered to Scott Hall, an extremely popular talent working as Razor Ramon in the WWF. On May 27, 1996, Hall would interrupt a match, entering through the crowd and working under the guise of being a WWF of talent who was invading WCW. He was originally set to have entrance music for his debut, but it was Larry Zbysko who would mention that if he was an invader, why would he have theme music? So instead, Hall would just walk in and proclaim, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. And he also declared that if WCW wanted a war, then they were going to get one. And as we would later find out, he would have two associates that would help him take over World Championship Wrestling. Now, not every fan knew who they were at the time, although the smart fans were aware that Kevin Nash had left the WWF as well. Speculation was confirmed two weeks later when Nash would be revealed as the second man, joining Scott Hall to form The Outsiders. Then the following week, June 17th, we would see the beginning of the legendary 83 weeks. Now, the reason why WCW was winning really wasn't a mystery. The Outsiders were the hottest angle in professional wrestling at the time. And while there are people out there who say that Kevin Nash can't draw, no, he wasn't on the level that Hulk Hogan was during his time as WWF Champion, but he still can bring in money as WCW definitely saw. But the NWO does serve as a perfect example of how one individual doesn't have to be the sole means of income for an entire company, as you can have an entire roster draw for a promotion instead. This served as the perfect in-story commentary. Many fans felt that WCW was now being overrun by WWF stars, so why not address it? The Outsiders were starting the war against WCW, seemingly as WWF employees, to which WWF took issue with. They filed a lawsuit over the implication and even claimed that Scott Hall's character was too similar to Razor Ramon, especially considering that Hall didn't state his name on his debut and just said that you knew who he was. In an attempt to mitigate this at the Great American Bash pay-per-view, Nash outright said that they were not WWF employees. Both men would start using their real names to make it clear that they were not still Razor Ramon and Diesel. But this didn't stop anything as the lawsuit was still dragged out for years until 2000 before being settled out of court, with the condition that WWF would get the right to bid on WCW property if they were ever to be liquidated. And yes, this will come into play with the sale later on. But anyway, back to where we left off. Hall and Nash stated that a third man would be joining their forces to take down WCW, but who could it possibly be? Well, while we all knew Scott Hall and Kevin Nash had left the WWF, did someone else leave? Could it be Brett? Could it be another Click member? Could it be Mabel? Nah, only an idiot would think that it could have been Mabel. Well, WCW already had WWF's top stars of the past and two of the top stars of the present, so why not combine them? At that year's Bash at the Beach, Hulk Hogan would join the Outsiders to form the New World Order. This would go down as one of the best heel turns, one of the best factions, and one of the best storylines of all time. Week after week, fans kept tuning in to see who would be the next person to join the NWO and who would sign with WCW. Whether it was Ted D. DiBiase playing the part of Trillionaire Ted, a parody of WWF's Billionaire Ted, who was also a parody of WCW's Ted Turner, and it was also a play on the Million Dollar Man character. Or The Giant, a homegrown WCW talent who was brought in riffing off of the connection to Andre the Giant. Or Six, the former 123 Kid and the future X-Pac, as you never knew who was going to be next to join the fray. Meanwhile, WWF was countering with very, very little. Shawn Michaels was an unimpressive champion, failing to move the needle against his old friends, and he couldn't hold a candle to Hogan. Plus, his internal struggles and backstage attitude was causing dissension in the locker room. Although, while WWF wasn't producing anything close to this caliber back when all this was going on, they were still sowing the seeds that would eventually get them the win as the 1996 King of the Ring featured the Austin 316 promo, and later on in the year, The Rock, Rocky Maivia, would make his debut. 
In September, the NWO would make their move, with many members of the WCW roster over in Japan, tying into the whole cross-promotion and international work that Eric Bischoff was already doing, the New World Order took this as an opportunity to take over Nitro. And after walking out of WCW for being accused of joining the NWO when he hadn't, it was clear that everything was all about Sting. The story was now all leading up to this. Longtime franchise player Sting would return as the hero to vanquish Hollywood Hogan. It would be the perfect conclusion to the perfect story, rewarding the company man and putting him at the top of the mountain where he belongs. Well, almost. Aside from a few minor mishaps like Lex Luger winning the title for five days, the nonsense of Eric Bischoff being attacked by the Outsiders only for it to be revealed that he was working alongside with them all along, Dusty Rhodes joining the NWO, and of course all the Dennis Rodman stuff, and the fact that Sting and Hogan already faced off against each other once before, the angle was rather perfect. Also except for the terrible ending of Starcade 1997. A convoluted finish was conceived where a debuting Bret Hart would prevent Sting from being screwed over from a fast count by referee Nick Patrick. The only problem was Patrick counted at regular speed. The reason for this has been attributed to several parties, making it impossible to know what really happened. Most put the blame squarely on the shoulders of Hulk Hogan, but he himself has said that the real problem was that there were no plans for Sting going forward. And if that was true, well, it showed. Regardless as to if there was actually anything planned out for Sting, WCW would try to right the ship by stripping him of the title due to all the controversy, allowing for him to win it cleanly at Super Brawl 8. And as this was happening, the NWO would start infighting with Hulk Hogan clashing with Kevin Nash. This would result in the NWO being separated into two separate groups, the NWO Black and White led by Hogan and the Wolfpack which was led by Kevin Nash. Which did make a lot of sense, since the New World Order was so popular, it was a good idea to take part of the faction and make them babyface and take the rest and keep them heel. However, there were many fans that didn't approve of this, as it was thought that they were just watering down the group from their original mission, especially as lesser members began to gain more prominence. However, these were just fan criticisms. On the inside track, some more professional opinions, which I may or may not agree with myself, were much harsher on Eric Bischoff. Some insiders thought that the guaranteed contract idea offered no incentive for wrestlers to work safer and to avoid injury, except for the whole, you know, injury part. And they also felt that the wrestlers would be more defiant since they knew they had guaranteed money, as the need to get paid is what keeps a lot of people in check. In addition, the concept of making big match cards for Monday nights was also seen as a bad idea by some, believing that by showing big title matches on regular TV, you're ruining pay-per-view buys and house show sales. This type of booking was viewed by some as hotshotting, stunt booking to quickly get attention even though it would ultimately leave you flat in the long run. But alas, Eric Bischoff wasn't concerned with any of that, as he was tasked specifically with the goal of taking down Raw. And he did just that. The important thing to remember is that overall the story was great. There were just a few minor hiccups and one major one, but nevertheless it was still very, very entertaining, and it got the job done. Yes, the finish to Starcade was a major error, but it was seemingly the only major error of the time. But even with that, the event still became WCW's highest grossing pay-per-view of all time. And even after that, they would still continue their winning streak on Monday nights for several months. However, these heights would ultimately be the summit that WCW would plummet from. Looking to capitalize on their success, Warner created a second show called the WCW Thunder, which premiered on January 8th, 1998. It has been stated that around this point is when Time Warner started to micromanage WCW more and more, forcing what they wanted on the product, cutting budgets and mandating the WCW turn more family friendly, a complete contrast to the WWF's attitude error, even though that was making the WWF a ton of money. Allegedly, this was due to higher ups at Turner who hated professional wrestling and were looking for any reason to get rid of it. Meanwhile, two weeks after winning the title at WrestleMania, Stone Cold Steve Austin and his feud with Mr. McMahon would finally bring the 83 weeks to a close. And as Austin's popularity grew, WCW figured they had to do something quick. WCW decided to put the title on Bill Goldberg, a former football player who was fresh to the wrestling business. He was presented as an unbeatable juggernaut, squashing everyone in his path, and he seemed to have a genuine connection with audiences. Goldberg would beat Hulk Hogan on July 6, 1998, which would be Nitro's first victory against Raw in over two months. But this wouldn't last very long as they wouldn't win again for a whole month. 
And then, after several weeks of victory, they would only get two more wins over the WWF, last winning on October 26, 1998. The show would feature Bret Hart and Diamond Dallas Page in the main event for the United States title. After this, Nitro would never take Raw ever again. But now, it all seemed like a little bit of history repeating. Just like with Vince, this was a lot of Bischoff's old roster working against them, as Austin, Goldust, Vader, Triple H, Edge, and Mick Foley all worked for WCW under Eric Bischoff. But Speaking of which, in the beginning of 1999, Eazy-E tried one of his old tricks. With Raw pre-taping Mick Foley beating The Rock and winning his first world title, Bischoff gave away the ending of the match. But this backfired, as Raw won the night anyway with many people tuning in specifically to see Foley capturing the gold. This occurred on the same night that WCW had planned for the NWO to reunite after being split into two separate groups. While Goldberg was doing good, he wasn't doing good enough to overtake Raw, and so WCW decided to revisit the angle that got him there in the first place by combining Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall back under one group, the NWO Elite. However, this didn't work. Nor did they use the use of celebrities like Jay Leno and Dennis Rodman, if you could believe that. This led to the unthinkable. Harvey Schiller, president of Turner Sports, had Eric Bischoff taken out of control on September 10th, 1999 with WCW VP of Strategic Planning Bill Bush taking over. On the other side of the coin, WWF would create a brand new show called SmackDown to counter WCW's thunder. However, this would result in WWF's top creative writers, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara, growing resentful that they weren't getting additional compensation for their extra workload. And with the pair being dissatisfied, Bush would offer them massive contracts. The hope within WCW was that WWF's creative team was the secret to their success. They were wrong. WCW's ratings slowly began to decrease, and Raw's would just continue to climb. But as it turns out, without Vince there to filter out Russo and Ferrara's dumber ideas, the inmates were now just running the asylum. And this sort of folly in WCW couldn't have come at a worse time, as WWF was actually at their most vulnerable, but they still couldn't be beaten. With Steve Austin being sidelined because of injury, the WWF was down to just one megastar. Now sure, that megastar was The Rock, but still, it's weaker than they had been in a really long time. But instead of capitalizing on the situation, they responded by vacating the title seven times in six months. And while Vince Russo was originally not to appear on screen, instead serving as the off-camera powers that be, he would become a major character on television, even winning the WCW world title, as did actor David Arquette. None of this, none of this was ever going to put World Championship Wrestling back on top. After all this, Russo and Ferrar would be put on suspension for three months. During this time, they had plans to make Tank Abbott world champion in an attempt to cash in on the new UFC craze. But Tank really didn't know the wrestling business, and he wasn't over with fans. And so, during this time, Kevin Sullivan was briefly put in charge, trying to clean up the mess that was handed to him. And surprisingly, he would book Chris Benoit to be WCW's world champion despite their personal issues. And yet, even with that, Benoit walked anyway, as did other wrestlers like Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, Chris Jericho, and Raven, who would all leave WCW within just a few months of each other. WCW's last ditch effort was to try and combine forces by pairing Vince Russo up with a returning Eric Bischoff. The new plan was to reboot WCW, vacating all titles and changing the logo. This time around, heels and faces were seen as antiquated and being replaced by the Millionaires Club and the New Blood, the established stars versus the younger talents respectively. But good guys and bad guys are a part of the industry for a reason, and people just kind of settle into these roles no matter or what. It didn't matter anyway, as this new arrangement really wouldn't last for very long, as Russo began to clash with Hulk Hogan, leading to the incident at Bash at the Beach 2000, where Hogan would get to pin Jeff Jarrett for the title, only for Vince Russo to come out, cut a scathing promo on Hogan, and declared that the real world title match would be between Booker T and Jeff Jarrett, and that the match with Hogan meant nothing. Bischoff would leave the company after this, and Russo would be out by the end of the year. John Laurinaitis would be put in charge of the company as it was drawing to a close. 
As it turns out, since 1996, Time Warner had bought Turner Broadcasting, and it would appear that WCW was losing millions, 60 million in just the year 2000 alone. Thus, with America Online being merged with Time Warner in 2001 and Ted Turner being forced out, World Championship Wrestling was seen as a losing operation, and the new company of AOL Time Warner was looking to ditch it quickly. And while several parties were interested, including Eric Bischoff himself, WCW and its intangible properties were sold to Vince McMahon on March 23rd, 2001. However, top stars like Sting, Ric Flair, and Goldberg, as well as many others, were all contracted by AOL Time Warner itself, not WCW. And so, if Vince wanted them, he would have to buy out their contracts, or simply wait till they expired and make them new deals. He chose the latter. The final episode of WCW Nitro aired on March 26, 2001 from Panama City Beach, Florida. It featured a simulcast of Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon talking about the purchase as as well as the final match of Nitro being between Sting and Ric Flair, which was a match that was also featured on the very first episode as well. But this last episode of Nitro didn't even beat Raw, as it only drew 2.6, which was still a slight increase from the previous week. The WWF would double this rating with 5.2, getting the victory just one more time. The first thing I have to say before we get into any of the rules is that Bill Watts, as previously covered on this channel, is a big believer in kayfabe. And with that, one of the first controversies you could say about these rules is that the line between kayfabe and reality is somewhat blurred and it's hard to distinguish between the two. And to confound the issue even more, Bill Watts laid out a list of rules on television in character that may or may not work in tandem with these backstage rules. Uh, you know what, you'll see what I mean. Let's just, let's get into the first entry. Use of the barricades and ring posts is forbidden and will cause for an automatic disqualification. Okay, so first, know that this is indeed a backstage rule. However, the consequence is a kayfabe one, with disqualification being the only punishment. And so, this is why a lot of people tend to mix up the authentic and the inauthentic with this whole situation. But the whole thing makes a lot more sense when you stop to think about it. For example, if you're doing something that's a blatant violation right in front of the referee, well, why isn't he disqualifying you? Now sure, on TV, we're all kinda used to seeing tight shots where we only see the action, but when you're live, everyone can plainly see that there's a referee standing right there and doing nothing about blatant violations. So, in a world of OMG moments from WWE video games, we do tend to forget that some of these things really should be counted as disqualifications. For example, in a standard match, if you brought a table into the ring and used it, that would be grounds for disqualification. However, However, if you put someone through the announce table outside the ring, no one says anything. And it should be the exact same thing when it comes to ring posts and guardrails. If this was a legitimate wrestling contest, there's no way you could use any of these items. Imagine a boxing match where a boxer takes his opponent outside the ring and smashes him into the post. You can't, can you? Because it would be absolutely ridiculous. But for some reason, we just accept this in professional wrestling, even though we probably shouldn't. So the thinking here is to try and make wrestling seem more legitimate. It should have some sort of rule assemblance. But at the same time, there are a lot of people out there who will say that this is professional wrestling. It's not professional boxing or MMA or anything like that. A lot of this just comes with the territory and it's fun and it's part of the reason why they're watching in the first place. Anyway, let's go on to that second rule. Wrestling outside the ring is discouraged. Now, in order to further dissuade this, there were those on-air kayfabe rules that I talked about earlier, and the biggest one would have to be no moves off the top rope. Fans just hated that. Oh, and also, taking your opponent and throwing them over the top rope was considered an instant disqualification as well. Oh, but allow me to reiterate that these were on-air kayfabe rules, and Watts himself acknowledged this, as well as acknowledging just how much the fans hated it. And I know the top rope rule has been very, very controversial. We want your opinion, and we're going to let you vote on a big primetime special. The top rope rule, as of today, is rescinded completely in World Championship Wrestling. And again, the thought process here was trying not to expose the business. After all, it does seem rather strange that referees take so long to count to 10 whenever wrestlers go outside the ring. But just like with the last entry, it's really important to listen to the specific verbiage used here. It's said that wrestling outside the ring is discouraged, not forbidden. And so, just like the last rule, it's not that you can't do these things, just don't get caught doing them, and don't blatantly do it in front of the referee because you're making him look bad by not DQing you. Because if you want wrestling to have more of a sports 
aerospace presentation, well, it would really help if you treated it as such. Oh, and just in case you didn't have enough motivation to stay inside the ring, there was another layer added. Or should I say another layer taken away, as there was a strict no mats, no padding rule for the outside. And this was definitely met with some backlash. As there were those who said that having no padding whatsoever on the outside, just pure concrete, made taking bumps really painful and could lead to injury. However, again, the answer to this was, if you don't go outside, that won't be a problem. And again, outside the ring wrestling was discouraged, not forbidden. Although, to counter this, there were some who would argue the other way, as they felt that landing on a soft mat and landing on something that wasn't solid ground could lead to more ankle injuries. Regardless, allegedly, the level of thinking here was that WCW was not going to be the cartoon that WWF was, and that real men and real wrestlers don't need padded mats. And while WWE's current outside the ring presentation does look a lot more clean and a lot more professional, at the same time it does also kind of look like a giant playpen. So again, this is yet another judgment call. Do you keep padding outside to keep the wrestlers safe, or should they not even be going out there in the first place? Hmm, tough call. Absolutely no low blows. First offense is a $1,000 fine, second offense is a $2,500 fine, and the third offense is a $5,000 fine, and will be considered a breach of contract. If a wrestler is hit low, he is to make every effort not to sell the move as a low blow. Alright, so just like the other two entries, the important thing is don't get caught doing any of these things. Don't do them right in front of the referee and don't make him look bad. However, unlike the last two rules, you notice that this one has a real world consequence in the form of some pretty hefty fines. So why does this one have such a big bill? Now, I'm sure trying to maintain the honor and integrity of professional wrestling by not doing things like low blows is a part of it. But as good old Jim Ross said when talking about these rules, a lot of it has to do with wrestlers taking shortcuts and beginning to rely on certain methods as something of a crutch. Things like creating separations or even motivations for getting angry are very important when it comes to professional wrestling. But if they're done too much, then they kind of water down the experience for whenever they happen. And while, yeah, there are some things that are going to be constantly repetitive when it comes to professional wrestling, like punching, something like a low blow should have a major impact, as every guy can definitely attest to. And so, if some of these things happen too much, then they become tropes and they become boring. Okay, so the next three rules I pretty much just lumped in all together since they all have to do with the same thing. Truancy. All wrestlers are due in the building one hour before the scheduled starting time of the show, with fines again being implemented for being late of $1,000 for the first offense, $2,500 for the second offense, and $5,000 and a breach of contract for the third offense. However, that rule has to do with being late for an event. What about not showing up at all? Missing an event except in the case of the most severe injuries is considered a breach of contract. The only excusable exception to this rule is an act of God. Yeah, I have to admit that sounds like a real extreme measure. What's the thinking behind this? Well, the next rule will answer that. Wrestlers who are injured and can't perform are still expected to make the town in order to show the fans that WCW will no longer falsely advertise talent. The only exception would be a crippling injury, which doesn't allow for traveling. Okay, so I get it, not wanting to falsely advertise is a good thing, but at the same time, card is still subject to change, and also making a wrestler who's banged up show up anyway does seem a little cruel. Talking over the PA during the show is to be discouraged. Lewd hand gestures are prohibited, as is cursing loud enough for the audience to hear. Oh, um, it's not what it looks like. Uh, anyway, I do have to admit the no talking over the PA thing does seem a little odd to me, but I'm sure there was a reason behind it. Moreover, when it comes to the second part of this rule, as well as, well, all the rules that we're talking about here today, a lot of it was nothing new, especially during the older times when people had different sensibilities. Okay, in terms of using lewd hand gestures and profanity, obviously enough, we can understand why that was a problem. Even if it was a major factor of how Stone Cold Steve Austin got over in the Attitude Era. Man, it was awkward watching him just waving at WrestleMania instead of giving the finger like you know he wanted to. Fraternization between heels and baby faces in public is not acceptable. This includes traveling together to and from the arena, to public appearances, restaurants, and even to the gym. This also includes faces and heels, social together in social situations and the gym. Again, this is another one that's all about trying to preserve kayfabe. After all, if you have two wrestlers who are supposed to be feuding, then they probably shouldn't be chilling at the bar somewhere together. 
Although, as simple as this may seem, it does bring up a whole host of other problems. Like where Eric Bischoff pointed out that by having heels and faces needing to travel separately, that means you would have to double book flights. But allegedly, that might have been part of the goal, as it has been said that Watts didn't want all of his talent traveling on the same airplane just in case there was an issue. That way, if something happened to a flight, at least there were other people who could have wrestled. Now, as sound as that reasoning may be, there is another problem with it that Eric Bischoff would go on to point out. And it's the simple fact that what job has the right to tell its employees who they can and cannot hang out with? Oh, and also let's remember that they're independent contractors, not actual employees. Oh, and also, in some situations, trying to keep heels and faces away from each other can be rather difficult. For example, Sting and Lex Luger owned a gym together, so... How exactly would you go about explaining that one? No guests are allowed in the dressing room, including family members, media, etc. Okay, so this rule I'm gonna go ahead and tie to the next rule since both of them are kind of on the same wavelength. Each wrestler is allowed only two complimentary tickets to each show for friends and family. Any number of tickets above that number must be purchased at face value by the wrestler. Wrestling as a show has always struggled between two ideals. One, the visual of a packed wrestling audience filled to capacity, and also the idea of making money. Is it better to give away tickets that way you can have the appearance of a full arena? Or does this put you in jeopardy of having locals expecting that free tickets are going to pop up? and therefore conditioning them to think that wrestling shows are free. Not only that, but another problem that ties back into the last rule that we were just talking about is that some of the family and friends who would get comp tickets and go backstage began to feel a little entitled and perhaps a little too big for their britches as they started suggesting things like finishes and how to book a match. And if you're in charge of a wrestling promotion, one of the last things you want to hear is how to run your business from some mark that you gave a free ticket to. Now, this video is covering the history of WCW Saturday Night, but in order to put things in proper context, we're gonna have to go back a little bit before that. Now, this does mean covering some previously established territory, but a little bit of a refresher never hurt anybody. And with that being said, let's start at the beginning. On Christmas Day 1971, which was a Saturday, Georgia Championship Wrestling would air a Christmas special on an independent UHF station in Atlanta called WTCG. However, based off of the success of the show, GCW would make this a regular thing, officially leaving their old home of WQXITV. Then in 1976, WTCG would begin retransmitting via satellite, thus becoming something of a super station, if you will, as it was available to cable systems all all across the country, resulting in Georgia Championship Wrestling being aired nationally. Then in 1979, the channel would be redubbed as WTBS. Georgia Championship Wrestling, the television series, was hosted by the legendary Gordon Soley and was taped out of WTBS Studios, which was located at 1050 Techwood Drive in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was filmed before a live studio audience. Following this in 1982, and company bigwig Jim Barnett would change the name of the show from Georgia Championship Wrestling to World Championship Wrestling, which was a name that he previously used for another promotion in Australia. This was the result of station owner Ted Turner wanting the show to have a less localized feel, and this also coincided with the fact that GCW had already been running shows in neutral territories like Ohio and Michigan. Now, the new World Championship Wrestling show would continue taping in TBS Studios until March of 1989, when it was moved to West Peachtree Street and the Center Stage Concert Complex, and this initial taping would see a re of the old Mid-South commentary team with Jim Ross and Michael Hayes on the announce desk. However, just two years later, and this would lead to the infamous Black Saturday, where WWF owner Vince McMahon would buy the majority shares of Georgia Championship Wrestling in order to air his own programming. However, GCW fans were upset, and Vince really wasn't helping anything as he just wound up re-airing a lot of old WWF shows. All this resulted in the ratings tanking, infuriating that of Ted Turner, who was in the least hoping for some original content instead. And so, something of a coup was formed, as Ted Turner went to Ole Anderson, the last remaining shareholder who refused to sell his shares of GCW to Vince McMahon. Turner offered Ole's brand new promotion, Championship Wrestling from Georgia, a Saturday morning time slot at 7 a.m. And he would also give Bill Watts and Mid-South Wrestling a one-hour time slot on Sunday. This infuriated Vince McMahon, who was hoping to be the only 
family wrestling show on TBS. And now, both McMahon and Turner were angry at each other and something had to be done. And so, Vince McMahon would throw in the towel, selling his time slot to Jim Crockett Promotions for $1 million in March of 1985. And just as soon as April 6th of that same year, Jim Crockett Promotions would air their first episode of World Championship Wrestling. And now, with Jim Crockett Jr. in the fray, things started to change rapidly, as the younger Crockett would merge his promotion with that of Championship Wrestling from Georgia, giving them two Saturday time slots. However, surprisingly coming out on the short end of the stick was WTBS's most watched show, which was Bill Watts's Mid-South Wrestling, which was cancelled as a result of this deal. And Mid-South, which would eventually change its name to the Universal Wrestling Federation, would just wind up being sold to Crockett in 1987. Then, following Turner Broadcasting's purchase of Jim Crockett Promotions in 1988, and World Championship Wrestling would go from being just the mere name of the show to being the name of a brand new promotion owned by Turner. Saturday night, 6.05 Eastern, turn to TBS. Now, as much as many Nitro fans don't want to admit this, real WCW fans know that WCW Saturday Night was the real show for World Championship Wrestling, as this was both the more established program and it was also the show that really helped to get WCW off the ground. In April of 1992, the show World Championship Wrestling would officially be renamed as WCW Saturday Night. The show was entirely repackaged, with a brand new home studio at Center Stage Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, although some matches would air from Columbus, Georgia as well. The show had an all-new neon aesthetic, as they were going for a very contemporary look. The original hosts of the program were Jim Ross and Jesse the Body Ventura, who were occasionally joined by Bruno San Martino as a special guest commentator. The next year, Year, 1993 would see Jim Ross leaving for the WWF. He was replaced by Tony Schiavone, who would stay with the program until 1998. Likewise, Jesse Ventura was replaced by Bobby Heenan after signing on with the company the year after. But the brain didn't stay on for long, as the weasel was replaced by the American Dream Dusty Rhodes in 1995, with the son of a plumber affectionately referring to the show as The Mothership. Now, the reason why the American Dream referred to the Saturday program as such is because as hard as it might be for some modern fans to read, realize Saturday programming at the time was the most important show. Well, today, we tend to think of Saturday wrestling as something of an afterthought, especially with shows like AEW Collision being a secondary or even a tertiary show, depending on who you ask. But let us remember that once upon a time, every worker was working for the weekend. Anyway, going back to the story. Dusty Rhodes would stick with the show until 1998. This is when Shivani was pulled so he could focus more on his other broadcasting responsibilities, and Dusty Rhodes would turn heel and become a manager for the New World Order. Just kidding, that never happened, we don't talk about that heel turn. In their place, Scott Hudson and Mike Tenay would host the show until Tenay was replaced by Larry Sabisco. And as for interviewing responsibilities, well, Tony Shivani and Mike Tenay did that as well, in addition to Lee Marshall and, of course, Mean Gene Okerlund. Now, as for the overall look of the show, that would change many times as well, since within two years, the set would be redesigned for a brand new futuristic look, featuring sliding doors and a fog machine. And then in 1996, WCW Saturday Night would switch locations yet again, this time to Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. This was the result of Turner's mobile production teams being preoccupied with the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. And we're not done yet, because WCW Saturday Night also did something else which was really unusual for the time, as this weekly program also went live. While WCW was mostly filmed way in advance, they did manage to go live a total of three different times. The first was when Hulk Hogan made his debut in-studio appearance. This segment featured the Hulkster and Sting being attacked by Sherry Martell, as well as the Stinger taking on Ric Flair, which was voted on by the WCW fans. This was followed by a second episode, which took place the following year on May 27, 1995, hailing from Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was to be an outdoor show, which was unfortunately caught in the middle of some rain. Then the third live program, which also took place outdoors, happened on August 10th, 1996, and it took place at the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in Sturgis, South Dakota, occurring right before that year's Hogwild pay-per-view, with this particular episode of the show functioning more like an episode of WCW Main Event, as it was used to lead in for Hogwild, which was taking place on a Saturday night, unusual since WCW pay-per-views normally took place on Sundays. But alas, this would mark the beginning of the end, because as WCW WCW Nitro's popularity took over, it became the main show, and WCW Saturday Night had to take a back seat. And this was only exacerbated when Thunder came on the scene. 
And so, what was once WCW's flagship show, and the program that saw Ric Flair win a world championship, had now become, well, bottom of the barrel. As by now, they were lucky if they got upper mid-card talent performing in non-championship matches, because they mostly had recent graduates from the power plant, as well as being a recap show for the other programs in WCW's lineup. And then, April 1st, 2000 would be the last time the WCW Saturday Night held their traditional format, as the following week it became strictly a recap show. Yep, that's right, for once it's not Vince McMahon who's to blame for this one, as it was actually WCW itself and Monday Night Show that took down Saturday Night from within. And so, just three months later, on July 1st, 2000, it was moved from its 6.05 time slot and it was changed to WCW Saturday Morning. This led to the show's cancellation due to low viewership, with it airing one more time on August 19th, 2000. However, after the purchase by WWF, there were plans to try and bring back WCW Saturday Night programming, with possible show titles such as WCW Saturday Nitro, Hard on WCW, and Late Night Appetite, among many others. But the problem was WCW by now earned a reputation for losing money, and no station wanted to pick up a program that was clearly damaged goods. This led to the quick and poorly done invasion angle and WWE instead opting for a brand split rather than bringing WCW back. And so, what was once WCW's flagship show, pioneering things that regular wrestling television never did before, such as going live or featuring world title wins, had now become a forgotten relic of the past. But while many younger fans today may not be too familiar with it, real heads remember a time when some of the very best professional wrestling out there happened from WCW on Saturday night. Thanks so much for watching this episode. If you liked it, please make sure that you give it a big thumbs up and that you're subscribed to the Thinking Fans channel. I want to thank all of my amazing Patreon supporters and I want to thank all of you for watching. And as always, Dave knows.